Thank you all for coming. My name is Helen Worka, and I'm one of the board members of the Alexandria Historical Society. I'm also the curator and site specialist at the Carlisle House Museum just down the road from here. And I'm so happy to be here on this historic evening with you all where we will be discussing the French and Indian War. Erica is a very awesome speaker and she's quite the professional. So you're, you're very lucky to be hearing her this evening. Erica is actually kicking off three programming days here in Old Town on the French and Indian War. At Carlisle House on Saturday, we have some flyers downstairs that you can pick up on your way out, but at Carlisle House on Saturday, one of the sites where Erica first got her start in the History Museum field, we will be having a reenactment of General Braddock's visit to Alexandria from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's a free event. And then on Sunday, here at the Lyceum, we're going to be hosting two lectures on General Braddock and his march uh, from Virginia into Pennsylvania. So that will have an admission of $10. You can pick up a flyer on this downstairs. And Erica's parents actually will be participating in Braddock Day. They're excellent reenactors as well. Oh, and on Sunday, one of, um, one of the authors of Braddock's Road, he will be, or he's the author of Braddock's Road, Norm Baker, he will be on site here to sign books too. Um, there's several books actually on the Braddock Road. If you enjoy Erica's talk tonight and you want to hear more, down in the gift shop here at the Lyceum, they include the Braddock Road Chronicles, War Under Heaven, and French and Indian War Battle Sites. So Erica is really doing a great job kicking us off here. All right, so without further ado, oh, one more thing, item of note. If you enjoy tonight, we also are going to have two more spring lectures for the Alexandria Historical Society. On May 20th, the lecture will be entitled, What a Place I Have Found, Julia Wilbur in Civil War Alexandria. That will be also on a Wednesday evening at 7.30 p.m. And then we're so excited about the 31st annual Alexandria History Awards that will be here. And we're going to have all of our local students highlighted. So if you haven't been, it's a really exciting program. We love to encourage all of the high school students to get involved in the history field. I was once one of them. I'm sure all of you were too back in the social studies classroom. So um, one of the speakers will be Jennifer Griffin, a local alum who's now a national security correspondent for Fox News Channel. And also Yvonne Kerrigan, the head of special collections and archives department at George Mason University. So please join us for that special evening as well. And now, I will introduce Erica. Her topic tonight is the life and times of Charlotte Brown, gender and rank during the Seven Years' War. So Erica is a native of Pittsburgh, PA, and is the new director of history and collections at Fort Ligonier in Ligonier, Pennsylvania. She's also a doctoral candidate at the University of Albany, SUNY, up in New York, working towards the completion of her dissertation the Dutch had a very bad opinion of me, Anglo-Dutch relations in Albany during the Seven Years' War. Ms. Knuckles is an alumni of the 2013 Yale Public History Institute and has previously worked at Kralo State Historic Site, which is the Museum of the Colonial Dutch in the Hudson River Valley in Rensselaer, New York, the Carlisle House Historic Park here in Old Town Alexandria, and the DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution Museum in Washington, DC, as well as the Bushy Run Battlefield in Jeanette, PA. Welcome, Erica. Thank you so much, Helen, for that wonderful introduction. It's so nice to be back in Old Town been having little mini reunions all evening, which is really exciting. I just absolutely loved working at the Carlisle House, um, and it's been really fun to show my husband around. It's his first time here. Um, so how many of you have heard of Charlotte Brown before? All right, we have, we have a few. And then we have a few newbies who don't really know who Charlotte Brown is. So. Um, Charlotte Brown is the topic of my dissertation, and she's a really fascinating woman. Um, and so in the limited time that I have tonight, I'm going to try to give you an overview of her adult life. She was part of the Braddock 
um, Braddock's army. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about what happened to her before she came over and sort of why she ended up with Braddock's army. Um, because I think when we, we study these things, we often forget, where did these people come from? Um, so I'll, I'll definitely touch on her time in North America as well. So you're really going to get a, a broad overview of her adult life. So. In the fall of 1754, Charlotte Brown prepared to embark on a journey from London to North America as matron of the British Army during the early stages of the Seven Years' War. Faced with issues common to 18th century women, like being a dutiful wife and mother, Brown's role as matron in the British Army was a complex expression of her obligations to both family and country. Although Brown's experience may seem exceptional for her time, the major influences on her life remained the same as her female contemporaries. Women were dependent on men during the 18th century. Their upbringing and education, formal or not, were designed to train them to be proper wives and mothers able to run a household. Brown was taught that love, self-sacrifice, duty and subordination were central to women's role in society. These ideal fem female characteristics would challenge and guide Brown's life in extraordinary ways. Interpreting the female experience during the Seven Years' War in North America is a difficult task, yet Charlotte Brown bestowed upon the historical record a rare personal account by not just a woman, but a woman of middling rank who held an official civilian commission in the British Army. In addition to her journal, there are other sources directly associated with Brown, including a family Bible and her final will and testament that helped to illuminate her identity and experience. In fact, it is her family Bible that I will begin with today as we explore the life and times of Charlotte Brown. The Brown family diary lists the births and deaths of Brown's children and husband, as well as her own. It does not list the date of her marriage, yet it is safe to assume that Brown was married in the mid-1740s. Her husband, Edward Brown, connected to the family through her brother, Robert Bristow. Bristow received his commission as Master Apothecary in the British Army in 1745, and was stationed in North America during the War of Austrian Succession. The North American portion of the conflict known as King George's War, that was from 1744 to 48, so this is before the French and Indian War, um, was the third in a series of French and Indian Wars fought between Great Britain and France over control of North America. In 1745, Provincial troops from New England, under the command of Sir William Pepperell, successfully took the French fortress town of Louisburg in Nova Scotia after a six-week siege. Following the victory, the British Army and its administration oversaw this newly acquired prize of war. Now, has anybody ever been to the fortress Louisburg in Nova Scotia? Sometimes I get, go there, please. It's amazing. It's gorgeous. Following his appointment as Master Apothecary, Bristow was sent to the Fortress Louisburg, where his sister's husband, Edward Brown, served as the Clerk of Czech for the British Army. The Clerk of Czech was a civilian position established to enforce financial control in the British Army. So Brown's husband's duty was to submit muster rolls, which were lists of men in active service periodically throughout the year. And in order to fulfill his duty, Brown was in direct contact with the hospital at Louisburg to keep track of absentee soldiers. So it is apparently through the Army's apothecary, Robert Bristow, who is Charlotte Brown's brother, so her maiden name is Bristow, Charlotte Bristow, that Edward Brown, and Charlotte Bristow were introduced. So they're all working at Louisburg. <laughs> 
and um, Charlotte Brown's husband has to check in at the hospital frequently, and that's where Charlotte Brown and her brother, Robert Bristow, work. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the couple was united in marriage, um, either in London before departing for Louisburg, or while serving at the fortress in Nova Scotia. Regardless, Brown's devotion to her husband is apparent in her journal, where she refers to him as my dear husband, a reflection of her socialization as a female Briton. The ideal British woman was a devoted wife and mother, regardless of social rank. Also loyal to her country, Brown likely served in the Army's hospital along with her brother at Louisburg. While stationed in Nova Scotia, the couple began a family. Brown was around 24 years old when she gave birth to her first child on May 20th, 1748, a daughter, Mary Louisa, named after her maternal grandmother. The young family resided at Louisburg until 1749, following the return of the fortress town to the French by the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle in 1748 that effectively ended the War of Austrian Succession. The British still controlled a garrison at Placentia in Newfoundland, and Edward Brown was appointed the keeper of the rolls beginning in 1750. The British may have returned Louisbourg to the French, but they maintained their presence in the contested region. Placentia was a drastic change from the fortress city at Louisbourg. While both garrisons were a far cry from the metropolis of London, Louisbourg was much larger than Placentia and had a diversity of buildings and amenities to support its population. Placentia, on the other hand, was a small, isolated fishing village with a dangerous reputation that led to the construction of a prison and gallows when the Brown family resided there. The Browns joined a garrison that in 1748 consisted of one company of the Newfoundland Regiment and a detachment of the Royal Artillery that were ill-supplied, quite the shift from the 700 soldiers at Louisburg. Edward Brown's position as keeper in the rolls involved working with Thomas Hancock of Boston, as he had done while at Louisburg, to supply Placentia's troops, which was a difficult task. The Brown family continued to grow at Placentia with the birth of another daughter, Charlotte, on December 15, 1750, and a son, Edward, on March 7, 1753. While she may have done some work in the hospital, the tiny peacetime garrison offered Brown an opportunity to focus her energy on her young family. Many middling women continued working as they entered motherhood with their duty to raise their children, aided by the assistance of a servant or female family members. Starting and raising a family at military garrisons was, a was very challenging and unlike Brown's own middling upbringing in London. Unfortunately, she would have to guide her children without their father. Shortly after the birth of his only son, Edward Brown died in Placentia on May 6, 1753, at age 38. And the cause of his death is unknown but illness is a likely culprit that killed more soldiers than battle. So Brown was widowed at a fairly young age. She was around 28 years old when her husband died. While it was not uncommon for women to be widowed in the 18th century British Empire, the decisions Brown made to support her children offer a unique perspective on the ambiguous situation that widowhood allowed. Widows during this period tread a fine line between the masculine public realm and the more private feminine sphere of the home. Unmarried women and widows held the status of femme sole 
which allowed for greater rights and independence than their married sisters. Masculine rights, such as property ownership, head of household status, and legal standing in terms of creating contracts and conducting business. Yet widows were distinct even from those with whom they shared the privileges of femme soul because a widow had experience as a wife and of particular concern to proper British society, sexual experience. While young unmarried women were expected to protect their chastity until marriage, widows were sexually experienced and no longer under the legal status of their husband, a situation that created a potentially dangerous combination, particularly for a young widow like Brown, according to society. Literature of the period thus depicts the ideal widow as sober, grave, temperate, just, honest, faithful, charitable, peaceable, modest, chaste, kind, virtuous, and pious, that lived a solitary, private life. So this is the ideal widow, okay? While less ideal widows were stereotyped largely as a response to their ambiguous legal status as deceptive, wanton, angry, scheming, haughty, sorrowful, pitiful, discontented, odious, and sinful. Independent women were a threat to the social order. Therefore, the behavior and actions of widows were under particular scrutiny. Age and motherhood influenced the choices made by widows in the 18th century. Upon becoming a widow, Brown gained a legal identity, but also the burden of solely caring for her family as a woman. Widowers were more likely to enter another marriage than widows, although younger widows were more likely to remarry. So older widows over the age of 50 were encouraged to remain dignified in widowhood. As for young widows, many had children that required more economic support from a new husband than might be available to her as a widow. Yet, as a young widow with young children, Brown never remarried. Historian Vivian Bruce Conger describes widows who remained unmarried as being in a unique position to define or redefine their norms and construct or reconstruct their world in response to both the prescriptive literature directed toward them and the actual circumstances in which they found themselves. Upon her husband's death, Brown may have received the typical one-third dower from her husband's estate, which she could retain as long as she remained unmarried. If he had a will, his will is unknown. If anybody finds it, please let me know. Um, Mr. Brown may have left more than the typical one-third dower to his wife, but he also needed to provide for any debts he left behind, as well as for his children, in particular, his only son, Edward. Yet Brown was of the middling ranks, elevated above those performing manual labor, yet still in need of work to support her children. She needed to provide them with the maintenance, protection, and education suitable to their rank and determined by English common law. Left to care for an infant, a toddler, and a five-year-old, it was essential for her to return to her family in London. The London Brown returned to was a bustling metropolis that covered 10,000 acres and contained around 750,000 inhabitants. The Bristows lived in the vicinity of the adjacent neighborhoods of Cheapside and Cornhill. The area would have looked different to Brown upon her return to London because a major fire, which was one of the great anxieties of the age, in that section of London destroyed much of the area near the Royal Exchange in 1748. So even from the, the time she was away, her neighborhood would have looked very different. 
Brown was a member of St. Benet Fink, located in Cornhill on Threadneedle Street. Um, and her, her church was actually designed by Christopher Wren. It was a decagonal church. It had survived the 1748 fire, so it would have been um, something familiar. And it remains standing throughout Brown's life, although it is sadly not there anymore. Brown's church was also in the vicinity of her brother Richard's grocery. It was situated on Bread Street in Cheapside, an area of London traditionally known for its markets and produce, a fact reflected in, in street names like Poultry, Fish, Fish Street Hill, Garlic Hill, and Pudding Lane. Brown's reunion with the Bristows in London was bittersweet. Her family was introduced to its newest members, but also faced the dilemma of assisting Brown with the upbringing of her children. The ideal widow administered her estate or trade so as to maximize the benefits for her children, especially her sons, and to facilitate their education, apprenticeship, if any, and eventual entry into business on their own account. Because of the help and support of her family, Brown could provide for her children without sacrificing her social standing but it required leaving them in the care and guardianship of the Bristows rather than under her own watchful and motherly eye. Brown was an ideal widow in many ways. Her decision to leave her children in order to support them was likely a difficult one, yet it seems based on her devotion to their well-being along with the cooperation, support, and connections of her parents and siblings, particularly her brother, Robert Bristow. Brown's appointment as matron of the Army's General Hospital was no coincidence. A prestigious position for a woman, the matron was known to be recruited from among the daughters of clergymen, tradesmen, or other men from the professional or commercial, commercial middling sort. As matron of the General Hospital, Brown is distinguished as the only female in the 18th century army lists, a record of official commissions within the British Army. The matron's duties were largely administrative. She oversaw daily operations of the General Hospital, supervising soldiers' wives who were recruited as nurses. So she essentially oversaw a lot of camp followers. The matron, working closely with an apothecary, was the senior female member of the hospital staff and had a wide range of duties, both medical and clerical. She was in charge of the supervision of the staff, managing patients, and the procurement of pr provisions, furniture, and household goods. Brown's close relationship with her apothecary brother, Robert Bristow, was common among middling and upper rank families in the 18th century because they did not have to compete for an inheritance as brothers often did. But the connection between these particular Bristow siblings went even deeper due to their positions in the Army's hospital. Traditionally, a male apothecary and female matron worked together to oversee the daily operations of the hospital the apothecary received training through an apprenticeship, whereas women in the medical field typically did not receive formal training, aside from some midwives who did go through an apprenticeship. Brown would have gained experience as the sister of an apothecary, who had likely been assisting at the hospitals at the Fortress Louisburg and Placentia. Her family connections, upstanding character, and practical hospital experience made Brown an ideal candidate for the position of matron as another war with France seemed imminent in 1754. The timing was right for Brown's record as a virtuous maid, wife, and widow to benefit her children, allowing her access to an occupation by which she could support them even if it required being physically absent from their young lives. After bidding farewell to her children, Brown and her brother, along with a manservant and a maid, set off with General Edward Braddock's fleet aboard the ship London on November 17, 1754. 
She had brought trunks of clothing suitable for her rank, as well as a journal to record the events of her journey. Their ship, laden with stores for the hospital, also boarded soldiers, officers, and their wives. Brown commented about her accommodations on board. Went into my new cabin. Mrs. Barboot, an officer's lady, came on board and took the one next to mine. Having been given equal lodging to an officer's wife, Brown was grouped among the elevated ranks. However, several days later, Brown reveals the specific location of she and Mrs. Barboot's lodgings. Being Sunday, a great squall on deck. She says that because every Sunday there seems to be some fight happening aboard deck. Um, being Sunday, a great squall on deck between Mr. Charrington, the Army surgeon, and Captain Brown, the ship's captain. It began about the loss of some water gruel and ended with the great favor I had received to have my cabin in the steerage, which was an undesirable location. Despite her disdain for her quarters aboard ship, Brown's accommodations were far superior to those available for regular soldiers and camp followers. Space was extremely limited below deck, with as many as 10 men allowed a berth measuring six feet square that left soldiers no choice but to take turns sleeping. Camp followers, including soldiers' wives and sutlers, resided among the soldiers further cramping the space. In order to minimize illness, the berths and bedding were cleaned and aired out daily, and fresh air was pumped between the decks. Additionally, vinegar was used to, to disinfect the decks. With such crowded conditions aboard ship for lengthy periods of time, it is not surprising that passengers spent a lot of time above deck when permitted. Soldiers were kept busy aboard ship with various tasks, including assisting the sailors, fishing, and mounting guard. Idle hands were kept to a minimum among the rank and file to maintain order and discipline among the troops. Officers and their civilian equivalents, however, did have a lot of time on their hands. After a couple of months living aboard the London, Brown gives us a glimpse into the leisure time activities that in many ways characterized the British middling ranks during this period. She writes on January 13, 1755, I this day began to work a pair of catgut ruffles. What on earth are those? That's what I thought when I first read that. One of the basic distinctions between the lower orders and those above them in the social hierarchy in the 18th century British, in 18th century British society was manual labor. Those below the middling ranks were characterized by the work they did with their hands. While some members of the middling ranks did work with their hands, like artisans and professionals, theirs was considered skilled work, as opposed to the unskilled labor of farmers, street cleaners, or soldiers. As sailors kept the ship in working order, the passengers, like Brown, passed the time in ways suited to their rank. Brown worked a pair of catgut ruffles, an ornamental skill like embroidery, that was often acquired and honed by young women of the middling and upper ranks. Ruffles were an elegant addition to gowns attached to the sleeve at the elbow. Brown's choice of material, however, is an interesting selection. Catgut is a tough, thin cord made from the treated and stretched intestines of certain animals, especially sheep, <laughs> and used for, among other things, surgical ligatures. In comparison, as you see here, the finest ruffles that grace the elbows of the elite would have been made of expensive, delicate lace that would have only been appropriate for special occasions such as dances or court appearance. They were not a suitable accessory for any type of physical labor. The source of Brown's unorthodox ruffle material, her cat gut came from the hospital supplies available aboard ship. Although she used a material that was inferior to fancy lace, her ruffles would have achieved, achieved the same look as their more expensive counterparts. 
Her position and rank not only allowed her access to hospital supplies to play with, basically, but also provided her with the leisure time and skills to create an ornamental addition to her wardrobe. And I don't have it in this paper, but I believe her maid steals these from her later on. I think when she was in Alexandria, actually. Um, when Brown arrived in Alexandria, here we are, on March 23rd, 1755, she expressed relief at finally ending her foray at sea. I now think myself very happy that I am at liberty once more, having been a prisoner in that wooden world called the London. Four months and four days I have sailed since I left England, 3,000 leagues. During her stay in Alexandria, Brown took up lodging in a private residence in the town, although this was difficult considering the size of the army and numbers of officers needing proper lodging in the fledgling town of Alexandria. According to Parliament's annual mutiny act, members of the British army could be housed in private residences and inns or taverns as long as the owners consented and were compensated. With little housing available, Officers primarily found lodging in private and public houses, while regular soldiers set up tents in encampments located on the outskirts of town. Being of a pseudo rank in the army, Brown was thus able to stay in more comfortable places than female camp followers who would have slept in tents, makeshift huts, or simply on the ground. Her arrangements, however, did not always live up to her ideals. <laughs> this is a famous quote from the Carlisle House. I think people there are pretty familiar with it. Mayor Carlisle's lady came to see me, but I was at a loss to seat her, not having a chair in the house. She sent home for three. Having received a visit from one of the prominent women of Alexandria, Brown could not properly seat her, an event that was almost certainly embarrassing. This may be why she moved to a new room two days later, that had three chairs, a table, a case to hold liquor, and a tea chest, items that would better suit any more visits from the ladies of the town. Mayor Carlisle's lady was Sarah Fairfax Carlisle, a member of the powerful Fairfax family that owned most of the land in Virginia, and she was also the wife of John Carlisle, a Scottish merchant and leading figure in Alexandria society. Now, Mrs. Carlisle was around five months pregnant and had a son, William, who's 20 months, 21 months old. Children were likely a topic of conversation between the two mothers, particularly because Brown had just received word from her family back in London. Words cannot express my joy. Received a letter from England, being the first since I left them. My dear children, and all were well. My mind much more at ease. In May of 1755, Brown prepared to depart Alexandria and embark on Braddock's march to take Fort Duquesne. Cartographer Andrew Wall describes the incredible logistics of the campaign. The 2,000 soldiers marched in a proces procession strung out at times for more than three miles at a speed of no more than two or three miles a day at its slowest. Of the 407 wagons acquired for the march, Benjamin Franklin helped out with that one, um, one was assigned to the matron of the hospital. Most of this day spent in making a tilt for my wagon, which is to be my bedchamber on my march to Wills Creek. While a wagon may not seem like a glamorous way to travel or place to sleep, it is significant that Brown was allotted one. They were typically used for moving supplies, such as food, tents, or ammunition. Wagons were not generously provided, nor were they always in abundance. Even officers who traveled on horseback often had to share a wagon to carry their personal supplies. Those of the lower ranks of the army, both men and women, did not have the luxury of horse nor wagon and had to travel by foot. Soldiers carried their personal effects on their backs, as did their wives. As she set off on the march, Brown's position as matron garnered certain privileges when compared to most of the other women with the army. 
Her position in the line of march, however, did not reflect this prestige. <clears throat> she writes, at six we marched for Wills Creek with one officer, <clears throat> my brother, self, and servants, two nurses, two cooks, and 40 men to guard us. 12 wagons with the sick, lame, and blind. My wagon is in the rear. Even with her own small section of hospital staff and supplies, Brown was physically placed last. She was obviously not pleased about this situation and writes of her coachman's shared displeasure with her location. At break of day, the drum beat. I was extremely sleepy but got up and we marched. But my wagon being in the rear the day before, my coachman insisted that it was not right that Madam Brown should be behind. And if they did not give way, they should feel the soft end of his whip. He gained his point and got in front. It's a loyal servant. One of Brown's servants had to reinforce that despite her gender, she held a superior rank over the regular soldiers. Military hierarchy was typically reflected through the line of march. Whether Brown maintained her position at the front when her small hospital contingency joined the rest of the army's line of march is doubtful. Her superior rank may have bothered the regular soldiers more than that of the male officers, yet she was able to assert her position, albeit within the medical section of the army. The original hospital staff that Brown had traveled with from England was the same staff she had worked with while serving at Louisburg. The hospital hierarchy, therefore, was well established, including Brown's authority within that association. <clears throat> the roads, hastily constructed by the army, continued to worsen as the line of march moved deeper into the frontier. Opportunities for lodging diminished, and Brown was obliged to sleep in her wagon if she wanted any sort of privacy. This was a cause for concern among some of the officers. Mr. Faulkner ordered a sentinel to be at my wagon all night so that no, no one should molest me. The wilderness was seen as a dangerous, uncivilized place. This environment, combined with a multitude of uncivilized men from the lower ranks, could prove disastrous for the handful of women accompanying the army. Brown's combined rank and gender allowed her protection from poten potential misfortune, an advantage she and the officers' wives had over the soldiers' wives and other women of the lower ranks who likely had to fend for themselves in cases of sexual abuse. After 12 days of difficult traveling, Brown arrived at Wills Creek, the location of Fort Cumberland and the rendezvous point for the British Army and its colonial reinforcements before heading off to face the French at Fort Duquesne. Brown describes her new location as the most desolate place I ever saw and her accommodations, I was put into a hole that I could see daylight through every log and a porthole for a window, which was as good a room as any in the fort. And I think the L is the hospital where she would be working, sort of on the edge of that cliff. <laughs> um, so she was not very happy at Fort Cumberland. So the conditions at Fort Cumberland, and this is a truly frontier outpost, um, they were perhaps the most primitive Brown had yet encountered. Almost immediately, she became ill with dysentery, termed the flux or bloody flux in the 18th century due to the poor sanitary conditions at Fort Cumberland, and she was not alone in this. The illness prevented Brown from writing in her journal for over two weeks. When she returned to her writing, her brother and maid were both ill and there were reports of Indians scalping several families within 10 miles of us. Several families left their homes and came to the fort for protection. So it's becoming even more overcrowded. The British Army confronted the realities of war on July 9th, 1755, when the rank and file led by General Braddock was soundly defeated by French and American Indian forces at the Battle of the Monongahela. Brown received news of the defeat two days after the battle. 
It is not possible to describe the distraction of the poor women for their husbands. She's really talking about the camp followers, the soldiers' wives who were left behind. I packed up my things to send, for we expected the Indians every hour. My brother desired me to leave the fort, but I am resolved not to go, but share my fate with him. <clears throat> Braddock's defeat created disorder as the army attempted to regroup at Fort Cumberland and flee eastward to Philadelphia. It was in the midst of this chaos that Brown's brother, Robert Bristow, died of dysentery. Oh, how shall I express my distraction? This unhappy day at two in the afternoon deprived me of my dear brother, in whom I have lost my kind guardian and protector, and am now left a friendless exile from all that is dear to me. Continuing to suffer from the same illness that killed her brother, Brown remained among the chaos of Fort Cumberland for a month, eventually joining the scattered army on the march to Philadelphia after purchasing a horse. She met up with part of her hospital contingent in Frederick, where she awaited the arrival of the army sick from Fort Cumberland and recovered from her severe illness. After a month of residing in Frederick, Brown's official duties resumed as she and her colleagues prepared to depart for Philadelphia. Brown was set to accompany the wagons loaded with infirm soldiers, but separated from the hospital caravan at the request of her colleague, the surgeon John Charrington. Mr. Charrington desired me not to go with them, but to favor him with my company. Brown seemed pleased to travel with Charrington, who proved to be an effective male advocate as they journeyed into Pennsylvania, although she attempted to maintain physical space between herself and her escort as a way to express her status as a virtuous widow. Charrington rode in a chaise, while Brown traveled on horseback. Brown's attempt to exude a professional and friendly, not romantic relationship between her and Charrington on their first day traveling towards Philadelphia had no effect on the couple who provided lodging for them that night. We supped and desired to have two beds, but the mistress of the house said she presumed we were man and wife and that one would do. Mr. Charrington said, it was true I was his wife, but it was very seldom that he was favored with part of my bed. She said she was sorry for it and at last complied. So it was easier for Charrington to fabricate a story about why he and Brown needed separate accommodations as husband and wife than to explain why they would be traveling together if they were not married. Although they had to stretch the truth about their relationship to acquire appropriate sleeping arrangements, Brown, as the fairer sex, benefited from Charrington's negotiation when she was favored with a bed of down and Mr. Charrington with one of straw. So she, she had the good, good deal at the end of it. Brown and Charrington arrived in Philadelphia on October 18th, 1755, they sought lodging across the river at the Indian King, where they encountered what was becoming a common occurrence. Brown reports, the people of the house stared at me, and some said I was Mr. Charrington's wife, and others his miss, but he soon convinced them that I was neither, and then they treated me with much more respect. The following day, Brown reported to the hospital where she received a room for the duration of her stay in Philadelphia. So no more trying to deal with traveling with Charrington. Brown was very active in bustling Philadelphia, which she described as London in miniature. While in winter quarters, Brown maintained a balance between her duties as matron and her aspirations toward middling culture ideals, AKA her social life. Her most frequent companion during this leg of her journey was Deborah Franklin, wife of famous Philadelphian Benjamin Franklin. Franklin and Brown had similar backgrounds as middling women who made contributions to their respective families through their work in fields dominated by men, with Franklin and her husband's printing business and Brown in the army. 
Franklin served as Brown's guide to Philadelphia middling society as they traveled the colonial city in Franklin's chaise. The two women dined at the Franklin's residence, toured the academy, later to be called the University of Pennsylvania, and socialized with Franklin's many prominent acquaintances. On December 1st, 1755, Brown heard from her family in London. I received a letter from England and had the agreeable news that my brother was married and a prospect of his being happy. This was a bittersweet piece of news for Brown, who no longer had her only kin connection with her on her journey, and whose hope for a speedy return to her family had diminished as her first year in the current conflict with France drew to a close. She had yet to realize that this was only the beginning of this defining chapter in her life as the war steered the army north. On February 13, 1756, Brown reports, very busy packing up, having received orders to march to New York. After a brief but stimulating stop in the city of New York, Brown accompanied British troops as they sailed up Hudson's River, a trip she found enchanting. We were soon enclosed with rocks, which was the most romantic scene I ever saw, being at a loss to tell the mountains from the clouds. Charmed by the diversity of urban life and stimulating company she enjoyed in Philadelphia and New York, her arrival in Albany proved less alluring. Brown had come to Albany, prepared with letters of recommendation from Dr. Samuel Bard of New York, a formality of the middling and upper ranks that provided Brown with the appropriate credentials to be introduced to a circle of her peers in a new and unfamiliar place. Her letters presented to those at the fort in Albany were sufficient proof of her status to those associated with the British Army. Yet Brown became the subject of swirling, scandalous rumors spread throughout the community of native Albanians, who are still very much Dutch at this point. The Dutch had a very bad opinion of me, saying I could not be good to come so far without a husband. While quickly welcomed into the community and social gatherings of ranked members of the British Army, Brown's reputation among the Albany Dutch required correction from her colleagues, particularly from a Miss Miller, an old acquaintance from Louisburg. Miss Miller came to see me. She told me that the Dutch said I was General Braddock's miss, but she had convinced them that I was not for that her father had known me, made wife and widow, and that nobody could say anything bad of me. Her reputation restored, Brown soon wrote, several of the Dutch ladies came to see me and gave me invitations to their houses. As the seasons transitioned into spring and summer, the war began to heat up along the frontier of New York the summer of 1756 was a time of remarkable contrast for Brown and the town of Albany. In between news of hangings for desertion, scalpings and abductions of civilians, and failed battles and campaigns, Brown writes of colorful social encounters and gatherings with British officers and the Albany Dutch alike. So on June 12, 1756, she writes, a girl taken by the Indians just out of town all the fort ladies came to see me. So this is in the same passage, so this, this very weird contrast. This passage not only demonstrates the atmosphere of fear and paranoia that existed in Albany at this point, but also the support network of women working and residing in the fort at Albany. Yet two days later, Brown writes of a gathering of a different nature. I received an invitation to go a mile out of town with Colonel Glazier and Miss Miller, but were obliged to have a guard with us for fear of the Indians. We went to see a Dutch officer's lady and were kindly received. We drank tea and then had a fine regale with sweetmeats, strawberries, butter, and cheese, which is the Dutch custom. We returned at night in safety. These moments of diversion would become few and far between as the conflict progressed. The campaigns of 1756 did not lead to any decisive victories and ensured that the war would drag on into the following year. 
In addition to pessimistic reports of the war and the precarious situation of Albany as a potential point of attack by the French, Brown was dealt a personal blow on August 10th, 1756 that would leave her reeling. This unhappy day, I received an account of the death of my dear child Charlotte, in whom my soul was centered. God only knows what I suffer. When shall I die and be at rest? This news was further compounded by the departure of Brown's closest and most constant companion throughout her journey in North America. Mr. Charrington left Albany for England, in whom I have lost all my friends in one. In January of 1757, Brown received orders to remove to the hospital, which was no better than a shed, and it was so excessive cold that my face and neck were frostbitten and moving. By August 4th, 1757, almost a year to the day since she had heard of her daughter's death, Brown deliberately ends her journal. This is her last passage, and you can see here, she just, that's, the, that's it. Um, an express has arrived from General Webb at Fort Edward to the commanding officer who says that Fort Henry is besieged with 1,100 French and desires that expresses may be sent to New York and New England for all the assistance they can send. I here end my journal, having so much business on my hands that I cannot spare time to write it. The final year of her journal includes not one mention of social activity, only news of fear and loss, both personal and having to do with the war. And you can physically see it in her handwriting, too. I mean, her passages just get shorter and shorter. While Brown's own account of Albany during the Seven Years' War ends in August of 1757, her time in Albany did not. She remained throughout the duration of the conflict and did not return to London until 1763. She had been separated from her children for seven years. Yet she, along with the help of her family members, had supported their upbringing despite her lack of physical presence in their young lives. Like so many women of her time throughout the British Empire, Brown devoted her life to upholding her role as an ideal British middling woman, only she attempted to do so through extraordinary circumstances of widowhood and war. She died in London in 1774. Thank you. So does anyone have any questions? I know that was quite the journey we just went on. <laughs> Trying to fit her. Yes. Well, it's very interesting to learn about uh, Charlotte Brown. And I'm assuming that because her brother had that relationship, she would not have had a job otherwise. I think her brother had a lot to do with it. I think sort of everything was able to come together for her and that um, I think she had a very special relationship with her brother, both personally and professionally. So absolutely. So she, that was another thing, how she was still dependent on a man to get that job, even if it was her brother. And then how many other women would have had positions such as that? You know, I know there were a couple of other matrons that I've sort of heard about here and there. But um, she, so what, what happened and what I couldn't go into and which isn't, perhaps the most exciting thing to talk about, but the, there's a lot of um, centralization happening in the British Army during this conflict, and part of that is the, the, the hospital. So there are little hospitals here and there, like we have little hospital buildings for each regiment, you know, at Fort Ligonier, um, but the Army's hospital has been centralized. So she is the matron of the general hospital for the British Army. So she's sort of the main woman from what I've been able to uncover so far. So, you know, in 1763, fighting stopped in North America, but they're shipping uh, soldiers who became ill with malaria in Cuba to Albany. <laughs> so that's sort of where the hospital had ended up, with, which seems very bizarre, but this was just sort of what, what was happening um, with, a, with a centralization of the, of the army as a whole. Um, so she had a pretty, pretty high position. 
So where did she die? Where did she die? In London. Whereabouts? I'm not sure. I think she probably lived in the area um, that her family lived in. Um, and she, her parents actually <coughs> outlived her because they're listed in her will, um, which I thought was very interesting and unusual that her, her parents would have outlived her. Um, she had a sister that was still alive that's listed in the will, um, and also uh, her brother Richard as well. So, yes? How did you come across the journal? That's a great question. So I grew up as a reenactor, <laughs> doing French and Indian War reenactor and reenacting, and um, my mother was always very interested in, in learning as much as she could about camp followers and passed that on to me, and when I first moved, to the DC area to get my master's at George Washington University when I first started working at the Carlisle House. My mom had heard of this through this, the reenactment community that there was this journal of this woman who was with Braddock's army. And so my, she, my mom said, see if it's at the Library of Congress. And it was my very first trip to the Library of Congress and they wheeled, they wheeled the copy, you can see this is a copy, a negative of it, um, out to me. And I started reading it and it was so interesting to me because she writes about things that you don't normally find in orderly books and things like that. Especially she loves talking about food and you know the, all of her material possessions and she just has funny commentary about the different cultures she encounters in the different colonies and it just was this fabulous um, woman and especially because she's a middling woman. She's not even a regular camp follower. Um, and I think because she's a woman, she also, you, she talks about the camp followers too. What is most fascinating to me about this and speaks volumes about her rank in society is she never talks about working at the hospital. <laughs> because that just would not be appropriate, right? I mean, I'm sure she's, she's seeing pretty horrible things every day in the hospital. Um, and she never writes about it. <laughs> So the things she doesn't write about tell volumes about her as well. Yep. I have two questions. So how many, you mentioned like a handful of female camp followers. I'm wondering if you have an idea oh, how many. There so. were a lot with Braddock's army. Um, I mean, there, he complained about them all the time. That's how, they, that's how we know about the camp followers is usually because <laughs> someone is complaining about them. And there were a lot. And I know many, I think there were hundreds. And I think that, um, there were many that were killed during the defeat as well. Women were also victims of Braddock's defeat because um, they were, were not expecting, as we all know, to be attacked where they were. So it, got, it was this sort of awful bottleneck situation and many, many children were, or women were um, killed. Um, and you know, the evidence of women is so scant. And if you ever come to Fort Ligonier, we have some very rare physical evidence of women. We have their shoes. Um, that archaeologists have found, and also the shoes of children, because we know there were children with the army too. Um, so any sort of physical th evidence of what they wore is so rare and special to be able to say, yes, they were here, here's their shoes, they were like Cinderella, they left them behind for us. Yeah. What is the definition of a camp follower? A camp follower actually is Anyone who's really following the army, we typically think of it as soldiers' wives, but really it encompasses really any civilians that are coming with the army, so sutlers who are selling goods to the army, and there's a whole range of, of those as well. Um, any sort of like wagoneers and stuff like that. Yeah, the female camp followers, their primary functions were um, they would serve as nurses um, and they did the laundry. Those were the main things that they did for the army. You know, the men had to cook for themselves. They cooked in a mess. And, um, but there was a lot of laundry to be done, <laughs> um, especially when you have thousands of soldiers in a place. Um, and nursing was an essential duty. So that's really where Charlotte Brown comes in, because she's really overseeing. The, those nurses have to report to her as the matron. So that, that's that hierarchy. Yes? Is there any record of how long she was actually sending back to London? Um, I have a few in the back of her journal. There's a, there's a copy also at the New York Historical Study, and that one has more information in the back of it. 
and it has her records when she returns to London. Um, and I have yet to really sit down and analyze those yet. I just got a copy of those. Um, but I'm not sure exactly what she was being paid. Um, there, I haven't found a record of that, but she probably was paid pretty well, especially for a woman. Um, and I'd have to really just compare her pay to the other hospital staff um, to try to see where she would fit in. Because we certainly have more records of what men were being paid <laughs> than we do of women. Um, but that's a good question. It certainly was helping. I don't, I don't know if she would have come. I mean, it's hard to put our modern sensibilities on it to try to figure out why would she do this? Why would she leave her children? Um, but I do think being a widow had a lot to do with it. She was fortunate to have the, the help of her family, but she had to have been making something to be able to, something <coughs> significant, I think, to be able to send back to her family. And I also don't think she anticipated being gone for seven years. Um, I don't think Braddock thought <laughs> the war would, I don't think anybody thought at the beginning of the war that it was gonna last that long. So. Two questions. Do you have any literature that describes her, her physical attributes? No. Uh, I don't, I know. Wouldn't it be great if we could find a portrait of her? Yes. And the second question is, would be on top of that is, do you, did she write in her journal if she had any suitors or any requests for marriage? You know, it's funny, she has a weird relationship with Mr. Charrington, which I didn't get into it. He's married, you know, his wife's back in England. Um, or actually, she might have been around, because I think he had some of her things. And he's sort of, I think, making passes at her, and she, she wants nothing of it. Um, you know, she, she's sort of, she gets in fights with him, and he gets really angry, and then takes it out on his servant, you know, like beats his servant. You know, she wakes up in the morning and he's like wailing on his servant because he's mad at her because she said something haughty, you know. We have to really read between the lines because she's not, you know, writing out their whole argument. He seemed to have quite the temper. He was always getting in fights on the ship with people as well. Um, but other than that, um, I, I, haven't, I haven't sensed anything. I think in Albany, she was pretty miserable, so I don't really think she was, focusing on her love life very much. And I, I don't think she was really interested in that. I think the death of her husband had been pretty devastating to her and she just had to make all these really difficult choices. Um, and I think she did find independence as a widow, but I don't think she wished to be in the, I think she was in a reluctant position to try to help her children. Um, but yeah, the Charrington stuff is, he's quite the character. <laughs> I think he got kicked out. I have to go, go back through my records because I'll be writing about that in my next couple of chapters um, of my dissertation. He, I think he got the boot by the army and got sent back to, to England. That's why he leaves Albany. He got in trouble, yeah. So we were talking about the mayor versus major. <laughs> so I think oh. you've done a lot more, spent a lot more time on this and you're translating a lot more 18th century stuff than we have to go I always took it as mayor. His major was his rank in the Right, military. yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Actually, actually, yeah. the time, Alexander didn't have a mayor. Oh, it did? Okay, so it would be major then. Probably major. Well, there we go. We collectively figured it out. That's why I love things like this. <laughs> All right. I have a question. Sure. Are there uh, any descendants? Um, I'm not sure, but I do know that diary was passed down to somebody. I don't know how they got it, but the copy of this was done in the early, early 20th century for the Library of Congress. Um, and they do have a list of the name. It's not a Brown or Bristow name. Um, so I'm not sure. Her, oh, let me think about what happened to her. She I think she, I think her son was the only one who like survived into adulthood, and I have actually <laughs> the information on her will that I can can pull out. It's in my other bag that I can, or from her Bible that sort of lists the the births and deaths. And in her will, I think he was the only surviving child um, of all of her children by the time she died. So, yeah, yep. Who kept the diary? So. Right after she passed, 
what's the history of I don't have the provenance. Um, yeah. And all the Library of Congress says is that it was made, it was a copy made by um, this, I'd have to look up what the New York Historical Society, but I, I recall it was the same information that it was from this family in, in England. Um, but they didn't really, we love when provenance is just laid out for us, but so many times it's not. I mean, I would suspect it probably was passed down through a family, and, but you never know. I mean, people find stuff in their house they move into, so um, you know, there could be a lot, of, a lot of situations like that. These are the mysteries that keep me up at night. <laughs> There's so much we don't know. Um, and that's the challenge for me on my final chapter when I write it, is it's after she ends this, how do I figure out what happened to her and really trying to figure out what's going on in Albany um, that's affecting her at the hospital because she probably was just stuck around there. I found little bits where they mentioned, you know, oh, report to the matron and things like that. So I'm assuming it's still her, that she's still around. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. <laughs>